And Lord, as we look at Genesis 47 today, bless us. Speak to us, O Lord. May the truth of the text empower us. May it motivate us. May it encourage us, Lord. May it rebuke us even. O Lord, rebuke us where we need. And Lord, we know that we do need plenty of it. But Lord, we also pray, encourage us where we need encouragement. So that we may be stronger, happier, and even more willing to follow Christ, to pick up our crosses and follow him, and be wonderful witnesses of his power, of his love, of his mercy. Oh, bless us at this hour. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let us turn to Genesis 47. Genesis 47. Here we are on verse, beginning on verse 13 until the end of the chapter. Genesis 47, we shall go from verse 13 until verse 31, until the end of the chapter. Let us, let us look at the word of the Lord to us on Genesis 47. Now there was no bread in, the, in all the land, for the famine was very severe. So that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. Then Joseph said, Give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock, if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's, and as for the people, he moved them into the cities, from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh. And they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their lands. Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow, and you shall, shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field and for your food, for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day, that Pharaoh should have one fifth, except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh's. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. 
When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. So far the reading of the word of the Lord. Can we agree that the past is very different than today? Can we agree on that? Can we agree that the past seems like a foreign land? Where people think differently. Where people do things differently. Can we agree on that? Now can we agree that it's quite unfair to judge the past based on today? Can we agree on that? Or can we agree that If the people in the past would look at us today, they would think we are very weird. And they would rebuke us in many ways. Can we agree on that as well? Can we agree that the passing of time does not necessarily mean progression? It may be regression at times. Can we agree that different places People from different places and different times think remarkably different. Can we agree on that? Now, it is based on that that I, that, I approached, that I approached today's text. In fact, every text should be approached based on their time. I'm not saying that there is no such thing as a permanent truth. I don't buy into that. But when we judge customs and way of thinking... Customs and way of thinking ought to be understood in their context. Now, I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, depending on, on where you are, and depending on the time of history that we're talking about, some of us would be considered extremely, um, in the, our actions would be viewed as, ex, as extremely rude or extremely unpolite, or even disgraceful. You know, some countries, preachers, they preach sitting down. Sitting, it was a sign that he was a teacher, and he's teaching his congregation. So it was common for them to be sitting down. Some churches in the past had no pews, actually. People stood up during the message. I see some good points on that. They had pillars on the church, and people would usually be gathered around the pillars. So they, especially the, the children, or if somebody was sick, they would be close to the pillars, so they, they, had, they could rest their backs. But they would be standing up. The way we dress. I see all, I thank God, I, I very much like this about our time. But I see all the ladies there in the church. I can see your eyes. I can see your foreheads. If not for the masks we are having these days, I would be able to see our entire face. Now, on the past, this was a big, a massive no-no. Uh, a lady going outside like that, uh, unacceptable. See, the men here, no man is covering their heads. Some cultures, that, that, I mean, you are entering a place of worship and you have nothing covering your head. That's unacceptable. That's, that's disgraceful. Men and women. So, it's the way. It's, I remember in one of a birthday party in my own house. It was my birthday. And I invited my, my, my friends in the neighborhood. And, of course, relatives came. And a friend from church shared the message. It was a brief message. And later on, he said, okay, let us pray. And everybody bowed their heads. And my grandpa was there. And my grandpa came to me later on and said, Felipe, I don't like that friend of yours. That one there. And I said, what, what, what happened, Grandpa? And he said, he did not take off his hat when he was praying. He had, he had a cap, like a baseball cap. He did not take it off while he was praying. I looked at my grandpa and I thought, 
do I say anything or not? And I thought, there is no way I'm going to win that. And I said, okay, Grandpa, I'll talk to him. That was the end of it. People think differently. Now, when we look at this text, we are very tempted to judge what we see here based on today's form of government, based on today's view of how society should be. And that is very unfair. That is very unfair. Because it is, it is difficult to judge customs when we don't really understand the whole context. And it's difficult to say even which time is better. The Bible actually, is, there is a, there is a, I think it's a proverb that says, do not say why today is evil than before. It's more, why the present days are more evil than before. For it's not wise to ask things like this. Which times are better? Do we live in better times than on the past? For example, you take the Roman Empire, the times of the Roman Empire. Uh, the head of the households were called pater familia, familias. So they, they are the, 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 the leaders of the house, the father of the household. He had so much power and so much authority over his own home that if one day he would, he could, he would decide to, I don't know, strangle one, one child or the wife or the grandson or the daughter-in-law even. That was it. Don't deal. He was the pater familias. No questions asked. Now, if you ask me, Philip, what do you think about that? In my opinion, that's abhorrent. That is totally against the Bible. But are those times better than today? Well, today, it's celebrated. You turn on the TV, wait five minutes, and you see somebody boasting that they had an abortion. Which times are better? Which times are worse? Difficult to tell. Difficult to tell. We talk about the way that children were treated in the past and how horribly, how horribly they were treated in the past. Nowadays, if a child, depending on the country where you live, if a child say, Daddy, I want to change my sex. I don't want to be a boy anymore. I want to be a girl. That's it. The government will pay for the sex change surgery. Which times are better? Another one. Uh, on the past, kings would not change a thing based on the, the, the masses outcry. They couldn't care less. If revolution was in the horizon, they'll just send the army, crush everybody, be done with it. What do I think of it? I think it's horrible. But look at today. Today, I mean, I think you guys saw that little girl called Greta Thunberg, speaking at the UN, the lady that had the angry face and said, how dare you? She said that, and all of a sudden, the politicians of the whole world want to change government policy because of a speech of, a, I don't know, 13, 15, 16 years old child. Which times are a bit more, which times are worse? Now, when I look at the past, I see some barbaric actions that I would never go along with. When I see today, I see barbaric actions. I saw, I saw a, a guy in Harvard losing his seat on Harvard School because he said a man is a man and a woman is a woman. Think about that. Now, we think the people in the past, they lost their minds. I can guarantee you, today, we are losing our minds just fine. So, it is very important that when we portray the past, we have to try our best to portray the past like the people of the past would also say about themselves. So when I portray Joseph today, I have to try my best to portray Joseph in a way that the people of that time would say, yeah, that, that's, we know that. You not, let's say I make a description of somebody and I never say the name. And the people of the past would listen to this description and they would say, oh yeah, we all know who you're talking about. You're talking about Joseph, clearly. That's how we should portray the past. As it was understood in the past. I think C.S. Lewis calls this 
chronological snobbery. We think that the passing of the, the ticking of the clock causes our mind of today to be more forward thinking than the past. We are better than the past just because the past is in the past. You know that silly idea? New is always better. You heard that? New is always better. No, we don't buy that. We, we don't buy that at all. But let us, having said this, let us look at what really happened here in this passage. What we, what we have here is a report of how God dealt with Pharaoh, how God dealt with Egypt at large, and how God dealt with Israel. So three. A specific figure, Pharaoh, a specific nation, Israel, uh, Egypt, and a specific family that would eventually become a nation, Israel. How did God deal with all these three? And the answer is, very well, benevolently, gently, and mercifully. That is the answer. Take a look with me on verse 13 and verse 14. The people, there was no bride in the land. The famine was very severe. So they all came to Joseph, you see? So jo- and they all bought. They took whatever money they had and bought grain. Of course, people with more money would have grain for more time. People with less money would have grain for less time. But the report gives us an idea, a notion that after the year or two years went by, there was no more money to be found. Whatever money anyone had, they spent it buying food for their families. The end result was that all the money was gathered by Pharaoh. And we see here on the end of verse 14, Joseph brought money into Pharaoh's house. I believe Moses is reporting this just to say, Joseph never allowed himself to be corrupted by bribes. Whatever money came in, it went straight to Pharaoh's account. He never lined up his own pockets. He never filled his own pockets. So I believe Moses wants to bring here a testament to the, not only the wisdom, but also the moral, capa- not the moral capabilities, but the moral fairness, the, the proper administration, the good and godly behavior of Joseph. Now we see on verse 15, so when the money failed, meaning when nobody else had more money, when they had spent everything, they came to Joseph and said, Joseph, buy our livestock. Now, I don't think they all brought all the horses and all the donkeys and all the cows, all the oxes, all the... No, no, no. I don't think that's what they did. I think they, they came to Joseph and said, Joseph, here's what I have. I have 20 cows, I have 10 donkeys, and two horses. Um, can we agree on this? They will be passed onto Pharaoh's ownership, and I will handle them. Because if they would move all the cattle of an entire nation to the city, I mean, to begin with, the city will not take it, will not sustain it. So I believe what we have here is they sold the right to the animals. So the animals are no longer theirs. The animal would stay there where the animal was always placed. But Pharaoh was now the owner, and the Egyptians would simply work with the animals, but Pharaoh would eventually be the owner, and I don't know, he would charge rent or whatever he was. Now, this was a very, a very wise move for the people of that time. Here's the thing. They had no money to feed the animals. They had no grain to eat. So, I mean, how, have you seen how much a donkey eats? A donkey eats a lot. A cow eats a lot. Now, if you don't have grain to feed yourself, let alone your donkey... So by bringing them to Pharaoh, actually was a smart move because Pharaoh would now have to support his own animals. Otherwise, I mean, what's the point of that? And so they they moved the ownership of the animals to Pharaoh, and they had money, and they had grain for an entire year, and the sustenance of the animals would even come from Pharaoh himself. 
Now, so far, so good. So far, so good. So the Egyptians became the supervisors of the, the cattle. They, they were not the legal owners anymore. Pharaoh was the legal owner. Now, we move on then to verse 18 and 19. Now, here things may start to get uncomfortable for the modern mind. Not for that time. Okay, not for the time, but for today's time. We see in verse 18, when that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. You can almost hear them saying, you know, you know, Joseph, we know that you are being very kind to us, but I got to be honest with you, we, we have nothing left. You have the sense that they, they, they're speaking with great solemnity. Joseph, the situation is terrible. So they, now here's a very key part. What we are about to see that follows is an idea that began on the people's heart, not on Joseph's mind. Look at this. There is no, verse 18, verse 18 still, right on the end of verse 18. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? By us and our land for bread. And we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die. That the land may not be desolate. Many non-Christians take this passage and say, you see, Joseph was an evil man. Joseph was enslaving the entire nation. How bad was Joseph? But they conveniently forget that the idea did not begin with Joseph. The idea began with the people. Now, what was really the proposition here? Now, let me explain this a little bit. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this a word called serfs or serfdom. It's a form of government, of gov- not government, but it's a form of governing the subjects. Guys, serfdom was a common practice throughout the Middle Ages and before, way before. Russia, until I think Russia until less than 200 years ago, serfdom was the norm in the entire nation. It, serfdom was extremely common in all of Europe for multiple, I would say for more than a millennia. Throughout feudalism, whatever nation had implemented feudalism, that, that the deal is the lord of the land, he's actually the owner of the land, and the people work the land, the people pay taxes, which is usually a percentage of the production, and they, they take care of, they, they work the land of the Lord. They work on the mines of the Lord. They work for the protection of the, of the field. Now, in exchange, the Lord of the land is supposed to care for their existence. It's supposed to make sure that they don't die. Protects them from outside threat. He has to command, lead, and uphold the military. So it's, a, it's an exchange of services. We serve you, you protect us. That's pretty much how feudalism worked. Uh, I see a lot of people speaking about that these periods in history, and they have not a clue how things worked. They thought that people all starved, that it was absolutely horrible, that if you did not have any land or ways to work, and if you not, could not pay taxes, you would, they would murder you. People exaggerate. So don't get your historical knowledge based on movies, okay? That's a very bad place to go for historical knowledge. So the people presented to Joseph a system that, to be honest, it was actually not new at the time. It was actually not new. Serfdom has been in history since the world began. Today, you can find locations that still practice the same. So they said, Joseph, this is not the custom of the land. Serfdom is not regular here. But that's the only way we see forward. Now, I want you to notice one thing. When people read this text today, the first thing they say is, 
Oh, what bad governors. They should be giving stuff to people. They should give to the people things freely. That's today's mentality. At that time, not even the people, not even Joseph, ever said, give me that for free. Or do things for free. Nobody thought about asking for things for free or giving things away. Neither the ones giving, neither the ones that would eventually receive. It was not on their radar at that time. Now, we continue. Uh, You know what? Allow me to talk about slavery a little bit. Slavery is a topic even though we have never had a period in history with such, so little slavery as today, people talk about slavery today as if it would be a pandemic everywhere in the world. Now, here's one thing that I'm, I'm going to say. Slavery is as old as prostitution. I mean, it's very difficult to think of, a, of an employment older than prostitution. And it's as difficult to think of a practice as old as slavery. Now, people today will tell you the following. Slavery existed because of racism. No. Slavery exists because of war and debt. Here, they were becoming slaves. Why? Debt. Before this, It's still in the book of Genesis. Why did people become slaves? Because they lost the war. Simple like that. War wars. War was slavery in any way racially inclined. No? Guys, even up to the Roman period, you could have an African with a slave taken from France. You could have a German with a slave taken from Tunisia. You'd have people of all races owning slaves of all races. Race did not even come in the conversation. Now, racism is a child of slavery and not the other way around. Do not buy that deception that a whole lot of people want you to buy today. Do not buy that. People in the past, you see, a a city-state would wage war against a different city-state, guys, sometimes 50 miles away. Now, how different looking were these people when you look at the color of their skins, the body type, the shape of the eyes, the color of the eyes, the color of the skin, the color of the hair, the kind of hair? They looked exactly the same. And one would rule over the other. What was the, what was the condition? Some won, some lost. End of story. So the serfs, they, were, they became tenant farmers. They, they were indentured slaves. They were forced laborers. Now, how bad was that? I don't know. I, re- I really don't know. I really don't know. But here's what I know that most likely you are inclined to think about slavery on the U.S. and using what they had at that time for to measure this time. As a Brazilian myself, I would be inclined to think about how, they sla- how slavery was in Brazil a few hundred years ago to judge how it was at this time. And the reality is, there's no way of knowing. But there are some suggestions. For example, you take, you take what we have here. As we move on the text, let me anticipate this. Joseph makes a proposition to the people. They said, the people simply said, hey Joseph, buy us and buy our land. That's what they asked. Now, Joseph made a counter proposal. I'll buy you and I'll buy your land, but here's what I'm going to do. I will make the state responsible for supplying your needs. So he said, look at verse uh, 23. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. 
Verse 24. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth, 20%, to Pharaoh. Let me ask you this. Do you pay 20% of taxes? You pay more, don't you? You pay more than 20%, don't you? You know how much the average American pay? 40%. Many, many, many countries in the world today pay 50%. Sweden, they pay 60%. That's income tax. By the way, that's an income tax. That's not a tax on product. That's an income tax end of story. Now, if, you'd, if, you were to, if a politician today would come forward and say, I will have only one tax, 20% income tax, end of story. You and I, we would want to kiss that guy's feet on a regular basis. Let me tell you that. Let me tell you that. The other day, I, I read a, an article saying how many days a year Brazilians work to pay taxes. I think it's 157 days a year. It's all for taxes. And then another, more another 100 and plus for breaking even. And it's about 50. 50 days a year, would, which would be just profit. So you're better off than when you began the year. This is 20%. Now, now here, I'm doing right now what I told, just told you that we shouldn't do. I'm judging that time with today's glasses. And in terms of taxation, it sounds awesome. It sounds awesome. Now, I'm not saying this to praise Joseph. I'm actually saying this to criticize today. Today we think we are free. And at that time they were slaves. But we are paying way more than 20%. And they were paying only 20%. Uh, now, let me tell this. At the time, was that too much? Now, we have Babylonian records showing that in Babylonia was common to pay 40%. All the regions went as high as 60%. So Joseph was saying, your, whatever you need to start your next harvest, we'll provide. You want seed? Pharaoh will give you seed. Let's say we give you whatever, a hundred, uh, let's say we give you a ton of seed. Now, you're not going to be paying based on the seed. You're going to be paying based on the harvest. If the harvest was plenty, wonderful. If there was no harvest at all, you don't give back anything. That's what Joseph is proposing at that time. Guys, this is about, uh, what, three and a half, four thousand years ago? This will be unheard of today. If, the girl, if Joe Biden would come to me and say, Philippi, here's a proposition. I pay whatever you need to live, and you give me back 20%. I would say, let me shake your hand, man. You are awesome. That's what I would say to him. Now, in terms of serfdom, in terms of the slavery of the time, guys, here's one thing that makes historical understanding difficult. The word slave is the same word throughout the centuries. But the practice itself was radically different. Now, in Brazil 200 years ago, if you took your servant and you just chopped off his head, what would happen to you? Nothing. At the times of Israel, if you want to go more into details, read the book of Leviticus. Now, some people read the book of Leviticus and say, look, look at how the Bible is so bad. The Bible gives green light to slavery. That's how they say it. Or the Bible supports slavery. Once again, it's misleading. Guys, slavery began way before the first... When Moses wrote Genesis 1.1, slavery was already a few millennia old. So what God is doing on this society is to put a break on the worst parts of slavery. So God is not allowing an institution. God is saying the institutions that have already existed for multiple millennia, 
I'm going to make it less severe in my, la- in my nation. If you read the book of Leviticus, you read about the year of Jubilee. Guys, this is very important for you to hear. This is very important. The year of Jubilee was a year that would come about every 50 years. So every 50 years, the Jubilee would take place. What would happen on that year? All slaves would be free. End of story. All slaves would be free. Have you ever heard of any nation that did that? Now, more than they, nations have done better. By the way, can you quote me one of the greatest names that God used to end more than day slavery? His name is William Wilberforce, a British Christian. And he claimed that his Christianity moved him to fight against slavery. So if you want to look at the reason behind slavery, you blame that and war. If you want to thank somebody for slavery not existing today, thank a Christian. It was their battle that caused modern day slavery to end. Now at that time, guys, this is once again, this is three and a half, four thousand years ago. The year of Jubilee would say that every 50 years, all slaves would go free. That's it. And, and, whatever land you bought would return to the previous owner. So basically, a a plot of land that belonged to a family would stay with that family for multiple, 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 multiple generations. So what people bought was the right to use the land until the year of Jubilee. So let's say you have five years until the year of Jubilee. Or the price would be cheap to use the land, to buy the land. Let's say you have 25 years until the year of Jubilee. The price would be higher. Let's say you had 49 years until the year of Jubilee. The price would be way higher. So God implemented this mechanism to do one thing. To prevent people from going into utter poverty. So there is God taking care of the nation of Israel. And seeing that the land is free from the ultra poor. Now Jesus comes along and says, poor people will always be present. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. But in the land of Israel, with that mechanism, people would be free from ultra poverty. And people look at the book, look at the Bible and say, what a horrible book. Now, let's get the opinion of the people of that time. Look at verse 25. So they said, who is they? The people of Egypt. So they said, you have saved our lives. Now, here's today, people looking at Joseph and say, Joseph was a bad man. Here's the people of the time. By the way, you and I, we are not suffering the consequences of this. They were. And they said, Joseph, you just saved our lives, man. We love you. So when Moses wrote this, Moses said, look at how God blessed Egypt. Here's what happened to the rest of the world. Mass starvation and mass death. Here's what happened to Egypt. The entire nation ran to to Joseph and said, Joseph, you are our our savior. Thank you very much. So how did God deal with Egypt? Very well. How would you feel about being an Egyptian at that time? You look to the left. You look west in Africa. And you see the people of what is today, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, all the way further. And you see that they all die. They are dropping like flies. You look east. What would be today Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates there, Canaan at the time, Israel today. 
You look at all the land and what do you see? Mass death. And you look at your own nation, but people are not dying. How would you feel? You'd feel like the luckiest guy on earth. You'd feel like the luckiest man on earth. So now we continue. How did God deal with Pharaoh? How did God deal with Pharaoh? We just read on the beginning of the chapter, not just, I mean, last Sunday. We saw that Jacob blessed Pharaoh twice. What, what happened to Pharaoh here? Pharaoh became the richest man on earth. Like that. He owned all the land. Literally. The entire nation became his private property. Apart from one land that we'll see later. The land of the priests. He became owner of all the cattle. And owner of the people even. He became the richest man on earth. That's it. How did God deal with Pharaoh? Very well. Why? Remember the promise that God made to Abraham. Abram, whoever blesses you, I'll bless them. Abram, whoever curses you, Abraham, I'll curse them. This Pharaoh blessed Israel. What did God do to him? Blessed him. Remember that a new Pharaoh rose up eventually? And that new Pharaoh enslaved the Egyptians? Remember that? And what God did to Egypt after a while? The ten plagues. What did, they, what did the Egyptians themselves say about Egypt after the ten plagues? One of the officers of Pharaoh came to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, I don't know if you know this, but Egypt is over. Each, our country is over. We have no food, no cattle, no nothing. There is not a green leaf outside. Open your window and take a look. You're not going to see one leaf green. Cattle, they are dead. A hailstorm killed the cattle. And he said, Pharaoh, do you realize the country has nothing? And eventually when Pharaoh ran away after, ran after the slaves, the Israelites to get them back, the military was wiped. So they were left without an economy, without a military, and without their firstborn. Every home. Why that happened? Because that, those pharaohs moved against Israel. And God said, I will curse whoever curses you. So God is so benevolent to all. And that's why the Bible tells us the rain fall on the just and unjust alike. Now, how did God deal with Israel? Let's go to verse 27. Let's go to verse 27. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions there. And grew and multiplied exceedingly. Well, why? Because they became prosperous. Because the land was good. Because they were not doing nearly like the Egyptians. How were the Egyptians doing? Well, they were becoming serfs. How were the Israelites doing? They were getting richer. Simple like that. They were prospering. How did God deal with Pharaoh? Super well. How did God deal with Egypt? Well, if you compare how he dealt with all the other nations, wow, Egypt had it well for them. How did God deal with Israel? Superbly well. Superbly well. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this simply to show that God loves his people. That's it. I want you to leave today's service thinking, I am once again reassured that God loves his people and God will never forsake his people. That's what I want you to remember. If you remember, I don't think I said about slavery, about Egypt, about Pharaoh. Okay, so I, I wish you'd remember, but so be it. But remember this part most of all. God cares for his people in a special manner. Now, I want to even compare. I don't want you to get a bad picture. God doesn't promise that his people will always be rich. Really doesn't. Take another man on the Bible, Jeremiah. 
You know, keep your finger on Genesis 47 and go to Jeremiah with me. I would like to take you there. Please go there with me. I'll wait for you. Jeremiah chapter 45. Right after Isaiah, you're going to find Jeremiah chapter 45. I want you to go there with me and look at verse 5, 4 and 5. Jeremiah chapter 45. God was bringing punishment upon a lot, a lot of many countries, particularly Israel at this time. And they were taken captive. They were being invaded by an external foreign force. And Jeremiah complained. Jeremiah complained at that time. I believe his complaint was of a financial nature. So the whole country was going down. And Jeremiah complained. Here's what God replied. Jeremiah 45 verses 4 and 5. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I will break down. What? And what I have planted, I will pluck up. That is, this whole land. So God told Baruch to speak to Jeremiah. Baruch, t- tell Jeremiah this. I, I'm, I'm plucking down what I planted. I'm wiping the land. I'm bringing condemnation. Now verse 5, this is the key part. And do you seek great things for yourself? God, God, God is bringing a rhetorical question here to Jeremiah. He's saying, Jeremiah, wait a minute. I am, I am, I am working my punishment to Israel this time. I am plucking what was once planted. I am wiping what was once raised. And you are looking for advantage? And you seek great things for yourself? So let me, let me get this straight, Jeremiah. The stock exchange is crashing, but you want yours to be up. Is that right? Continuing. Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I'll give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. This true report seems seems like a contradiction, right? The way that God dealt with Israel in Egypt. The whole world was going down. The whole world was falling upon a cliff. From a cliff, I mean, people were dying. Now Israel, (laughs) prospering. What do you do when you prosper? Be thankful to the Lord. Be thankful to the Lord. Now, Jeremiah complained. Jeremiah saw people's finances being wrecked. Guys, the country was being taken into captivity. And in the midst of that, by the way, Jeremiah himself was never made a slave. And in the midst of that, Jeremiah was saying, Oh man, my finances are taking a hit. And God said, Jeremiah, open your eyes, dude. Look around. Feel the room. People are becoming bankrupt. People are becoming slaves. And you have not, neither become bankrupt, neither become a slave. And you are complaining because your wallet is not as fat as before. So God brings both messages to us. If you are prospering, give thanks to the Lord. If you are not, if your finances are going like that, look at what God said to Jeremiah. Now let me bring you a better picture of Christians today. Let's compare ourselves with Christians in different parts of the world. About three weeks ago, a fellow student of mine in PRTS, in Puritan Seminary, fellow, fellow student, guy that studies just like I do there. And he said, um, a month before that event, so two months ago from now, one of his best friends in China was just arrested because he sold Bibles. 
They caught him selling Bible. Does it? He was placed, he was taken away from family, friends, jail. And he said, we have no idea how long he's going to be in jail. How his treatment is happening is going on in jail. Guys, I don't know. Please don't think I'm being, being gruesome right now. I'm just painting reality for you. We don't know if this man will be raped in jail. We don't know. His crime, he sold Bibles. Now let's, let's think about you and I. What do you, did you wake up today concerned that your Christianity would put you in jail today? Did you wake up like that? I certainly didn't. Actually, I woke up today feeling pretty good. Didn't have much hours of sleep, but I woke up feeling pretty good. And thinking today I got to go to church. I'm going to see your smiling faces. I suppose you're smiling underneath the mask. I'm going to see your smiling face. I got to do that. Am I concerned about being taken to jail? Zero. I have zero concerns about going to jail. And often you and I complain, don't we? We look just like Jeremiah. Maybe we, we are a little bit worse. All the Christians are going to jail. And we complain maybe because, oh, I'm not going to go to church today. Why not? I didn't have a good night's sleep. <laughs> I mean, have a sense of, you and I, we must have a sense of proportion. Pay more. Did you know that Christianity today, today, March 14th, 2021, today. Christianity is still the most persecuted religion in the world. Still. Now, if I walk 10 minutes from here, walking, I'll find, an, maybe not 10, maybe 5, I'll find another church. And from that church, if I walk another 3 minutes, I'll find yet another. And if I walk another 4 minutes, I'll find another. Look, look at how wonderfully blessed we are. We are still like the Israel in Egypt. We are still like Israel in Egypt. We, are pro- we have so many blessings. Now, here's one thing that Jesus, I think it was Jesus himself said, Behold, the axe is ready. The axe is ready to be put at the root Of the trees that don't bear fruit. Why did God give you such benefit? Answer me this. Did God give you the wonderful benefit to enjoy today? So that you may just feel good about yourself? God has granted this wonderful benefit of coming to church. Worshiping the Lord. And sometimes we abuse, we misuse this benefit. That we come to church and we keep looking at the time. Yeah, Felipe today went one minute above average. And other people are going to jail because they just, just sold the Bible. It's, guys, I'm not saying you do that. In fact, nobody has ever done that to me on this church, okay? I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Kudos to you. But careful how we feel. Careful with our, I remember Breno, you guys remember Breno, he told me one day that one pastor came to him and said, he was visiting a different church, uh, an elder, came to him and said, Breno, please don't go over the one, one hour allotted for the service. The rest of the world is being persecuted, and we are saying, oh man, if you go beyond one hour, uh-uh. Did you see the pro- the situation here. And now comes, we come to a wonderful portion of the Bible. Wonderful. Look at verse 18, no, 28. Genesis 47, verse 28 until the end. Guys, look at how beautiful this is. Look at how beautiful. And how the wheels, how the table have turned. How many years did Jacob care for Joseph? 17. Joseph was born and Jacob loved that boy with all his might for 17 years. And when he was 17, he was sold as a slave. Joseph, Jacob thought, my boy died. 
17 years. Now, what do we have here? And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. Who is taking care of who now? The tables have turned. Now Joseph is taking care of his dad. Isn't that wonderful? What is the fifth commandment? What is the fifth commandment? Honor thy father and thy mother. So that you may do well. So that your days may be prolonged. May be extended in the land in which your God has given you. The Bible calls the fifth commandment. Commandment number one. When it comes to reward for obedience. You want to live an awesome, long, happy life. Treat your parents like that. Not only parents. The commandment goes for all people in authority as well. Okay? And Joseph is doing that. Joseph is going to take very good care of his dad. And his dad, interesting, his dad did not come to Reuben, number one. Neither Simeon, neither Levi, neither Judah. But he came to Joseph. He was the highest authority in the land apart from Pharaoh. And he said, Joseph, put your hand under my thigh. Put your hand right there. Under his thigh. So I would imagine him to be laying down or sitting down on bed. I would imagine sitting down. So he lifts his legs. Jacob, Joseph puts his hand under his thigh and his leg rests on his hand. Very solemn moment. huh? That's a vow. They're taking a vow. You saw this on the Bible before, haven't you? When Abraham spoke with his servant and said, servant, maybe it was Eliezer, I don't know, maybe. Go get my boy a wife. Go find a wife for Isaac. But swear to me, you're going to do it like this, like this, like this. If you don't, if you don't find a wife, okay, come back. But swear to me that you're going to do like that. Put your hand under my tie. The, the idea there is, I have, I have explained this here before, guys. Actually, he was putting his hand close to his reproductive organ. The point there is, that's the source of life. That's, that's, uh, that, that was symbolic. Remember, these are different times. They thought about these matters differently. That was a very, very, very serious moment. So he made a vow. Now, if you look at the content of the, bow, the vow, you may think that's kind of odd. <laughs> it's kind of odd. You, the only time that we, I mean, very few times in the Bible we see people demanding from others a vow. And the point here was the location of his burial. Odd, isn't it? Imagine. Imagine today, if you die, and you come to me and say, Felipe, can you promise me one thing? Can you bury me on that cemetery, not on the other one? Vow to me that. I'll think like, okay, dude. <laughs> you are a bit weird. What was happening here? He had his mind on the promise of the Lord. The, prob- the issue here was not geography. The issue here is the promise of the Lord, which at this time, not today anymore, at this time, had a geographical connection. So Joseph is, Jacob is saying, Joseph, I remember the promise of the Lord. When I came down from Canaan to Egypt, God told me, I will go down with you and I will bring you up. Joseph, I'm about to die. Swear to me, you're going to bury me there. At the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham is buried with Sarah. Where Isaac is buried with Rebekah. Where I buried Leah. Interesting, not Rachel, Leah. Swear to me, you're going to put me there. Is Is he saying this because he hates Egypt? By all, by all, I would imagine that he was loving Egypt. He was prospering. But because he loved the promise of God. Here's what he's doing. Here's what he's saying. I, I left the promised land. But the promised land never left me. You and I, we ought to be people of heaven. We may not be in heaven right now. But heaven must be on us. 
heaven must be on us. The faith of old, the faith of this time. God, I mean, isn't it odd you read the text? In Egypt, who is the only people that never lost their land? The priests. Now you look at the religion of Israel. You look at the God of Israel. What did God say? God said, I am the owner of the land. You look at Egypt, you look at Egypt. Pharaoh is the owner of the land. You look at the priests of Pharaoh. They have land. They're the only ones that never lost the land. So their focus is, we have our land. You look at the faith of Israel. And God said, I own the land. All tribes will live on my land. But there is one tribe that will not going to have land. The priestly tribe of Levi. You see, there is the opposite of Egypt. In Egypt, you will not lose the land. In Israel, you shall not have land. Why is God being so bad with the people, with his own priests in Israel? The answer is he was not being bad. God was creating a mechanism for the Levite to think, my focus is not on this land. My focus is on the land that shall come one day. And remember Israel, Jacob began this chapter. I mean, not began, but on the, on the beginning of the chapter, he said, I am a pilgrim. Where should your focus be? Not on this land, but on the land above. The religion of Egypt was even, guys, the religion of Egypt was sustained by the state. The state gave the money. How is the Christian religion kept? The tithings of God's people. So God is saying, I sustain my religion. My priests, we're not going to have land because their focus will be on the land to come. They had a few scattered cities everywhere, but land? No. So God said, my religion will be different. My relationship with my people will be based on the promise to come. And I want to end this sermon with this question. Are your eyes on the promised land to come? Or are your eyes on the present land? Do you see yourself a pilgrim? Do you understand that your focus ought to be on the promise of God that will be fulfilled? And guys, there are promises of God that will only come to be when we die. Remember that God said, I am your God. I heal all your diseases. You may love Jesus and he may have a disease. When will Jesus fulfill that promise? When he gives you a new body. And he will. And he will never fail. Let us pray. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Oh, blessed be your name, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. You are the God above all gods. Hallelujah. You treat your people so well. So well. Oh Lord, may we love you so much. Oh Lord, may we make this deal with you. You love us and we shall love you. Oh Lord, in fact, you have made this deal with your people thousands of years ago. And Lord, in fact, we are the ones that keep on breaking the deal. Lord, you have never broken it. Oh Lord, cause us to be faithful and love you. For you love us more than we can ever comprehend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.